Welcome to Step 1 Success Stories by Physio, Episode 1. Limiting my resources and not comparing myself to my other classmates was one of the biggest things, I think, for me that finally let me get into my zone. You're listening to Step 1 Success Stories by Physio, the playbook of those who dominated the USMLE. If you want to learn how to excel on step one and get into the residency of your choice, then you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join the thousands of others who have mastered step one concepts using physio.com. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today we interview Pete Sunwall, who is a first year family medicine resident in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And to help me with this, I'm here with my co-host, Rhett Thompson. How's it going, man? It's going really good. How are you doing, Michael? Oh, it's going pretty well. I am actually uh, watching Han Solo with my kids right now, the new Han Solo movie. I think it's called Solo, right? Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. haven't seen it before. And uh, Benton is four years old and he loves Star Wars. <laughs> we got him this uh, Millennium Falcon uh, Lego, Lego thing yeah. for Christmas. And so ever since then, he's just been really into Star Wars. So... We're getting through that, and it's uh, it's been pretty fun. Awesome. Well, good. So let's introduce our guest now. And as Michael mentioned, his name is Pete Sunwall. Originally, he's from Utah, and he attended the University of Utah Medical School. Currently, he's a first-year family medicine resident in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And he's just at the tail end of that, actually, almost done, about to finish his first year and start his second. And through this interview... What really struck me was his strategy and his routines and just how simple and straightforward they appeared to be. And it just seems like anybody can adopt his strategy and, and use it for success. So let's bring him on. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Pete. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we know you're a busy man. Got a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to do. You're in your first year of residency. I know it can be a busy time. So thanks. No, it's a good life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us more. Why, why is it good? Oh, well, that, that was there's a slight bit of sarcasm in there, but um, no, it's really <laughs> no, it's really enjoyable. It's it's good. It's a little. I think it's probably better than med school, just because you. I remember being so frustrated because you're kind of like faking taking care of patients, you know, third and fourth year, where you're really wanting to take responsibility. But you can't really sign the orders and like all your plans are always like two or three steps behind because you know, the intern, the resident already got all this information and you didn't. And all of a sudden your assessment and plan is like two days old by the time you actually present. <laughs> and so that's kind of always frustrating. I don't know if you guys felt the same way, but yeah, but you know, huh. you're the one getting, really? you're the one getting the information and uh, it's stressful to feel the heat of actually being a physician, but it's also nice to be able to know that like, oh, okay, I'm the one taking care of this patient. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, resonates with a lot of third and fourth year medical students. It uh, certainly does certainly does with me. Yeah, first and second years, they will know very soon what it's like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, that's where you are right now. How about you uh, take us back to the beginning where you, you know, before you got into medical school, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in medicine in the first place? What got me interested? I um, So I grew up in a fairly long line of physicians, um, a lot of primary care uh, on one side of the family and ENT on the other side of the family. And so I tried really hard not to become a doctor for a while just to like stick it to the family. <laughs> um, <laughs> not that I love what they do and we're a lot alike and I love my family. They're great examples, but just wanted to do something different, but kind of got to undergrad, tried a lot of different other things, but nothing really resonated with me other than, or at least as much as medicine. And so sucked up my pride and went into medicine and, and loved it. I really did. And yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a road. I am, um, yeah, in undergrad, I, I uh, had a chance to play baseball, and so there's like this glimmer of glimmer of hope to maybe make it past college. But um, that dream soon failed. I was a pitcher, and it uh, it failed very quickly when I got on the mound and actually threw to people that were actually good. Um, the longest ball I've ever <laughs> seen hit off of me, actually, I guess like I guess the longest ball that I ever saw hit was off of me as a pitcher. 
And that's so like, <laughs> I should probably, I should probably like take medicine a little more seriously. And so <laughs> gave up those dreams and yeah, really grateful that I did. Yeah. Rhett and I actually know Pete from undergrad. Uh, we all, we all went to the same university and, uh, I remember hearing stories about you playing baseball. That's a, that's a cool experience, man. Yeah, it, it was cool. The experiences of other people hitting home runs off of me were those the experiences I told. Because <laughs> if it was the other way around, it probably wasn't true at the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I hear you have a a wicked fastball. Let's just say that. <laughs> oh well, it feels like ages ago, but it's nice of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So uh, you you got into the University of Utah, uh, and then you know obviously did well there and are doing residency now. So let's go back to maybe the first year of medical school. Can you tell us about maybe like the first couple days of your first year of medical school and what that experience was like? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess if anybody says that they were like totally cool and fine and ready for med school to start, I, I don't know. For me, maybe I made that, I had that persona, but I think we're, at least the people I talked with, like you guys and me, I was kind of freaking out inside had no idea how to study or, or I don't know. It's like this feeling of like, wow, I don't know. I feel like all our classmates were just, they climbed like Mount Kilimanjaro and like cured some sort of weird disease in Asia. <laughs> and I don't know, graduated from Ivy leagues. And I was from a state school in Utah, you know, I don't know. Like you meet some amazing people and you feel pretty intimidated first couple of days. And so I thought, I think that's normal. I bet a lot of people seem to feel that way, but never wanted to express it until later. <laughs> uh, how do you get, how did you guys feel? Oh, totally the same, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I said this before, but I just remember, you know, like the first couple of days, everyone just kind of sits in lecture silently. Nobody wants yeah. to raise their hands. <laughs> Everyone's just kind of like, I know this stuff. I got this. Oh, yeah. I remember good. that. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, so yeah, they just they just kind of feel like, uh, I don't want to raise my hand and look like an idiot. So oh, I'll just yeah. sit here silently even though I don't know what the heck's going on. Oh, totally. I remember there was like a like DNA splicing lecture or something like during our first week. And it's something that's kind of random. And I remember afterwards one of the classmates being like, oh, like how come they're going over this basic stuff? You know, shouldn't we all know this by now? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we totally <laughs> should. Like, I have no idea. I forgot what DNA is. So Yeah. So thank goodness they have foundations, I guess, right? Foundation, right. of course. At least they did for us. It's probably, I'm assuming it's probably the same at most other medical schools. Hope so. Yeah. That was really nice to know. So things ended up working out really well for you. Ultimately, you know, you're now in your residency in this awesome program. And to get there, you obviously did really well during your first couple of years of med school during those preclinical years. Can you give us any insight into like how you overcame some of the obstacles that you experienced during your preclinical years? Yeah, they, uh, you know, I think it's just, it's kind of getting in your own zone and figuring out what works for you. I hate, I hated it when people said that to me. <laughs> because uh, they're like, oh, well, just study what works, you know, how, study how the best way that you can and you know how to best study for yourself. And I didn't know. And I think that's what the whole first year was kind of about was figuring out how to study and how to remember things. And so I think it kind of came to light a little bit after I stopped comparing myself to other people. I think taking in what they've, what's worked for them is good. But, you know, I think I, limiting my resources and not comparing myself to my other classmates was one of the biggest things I think for me that finally let me get into my zone. Sadly, a lot of first and second year are always just so focused on step one. You know, I think everyone got first aid their first week of med school because everyone told them to start studying for step one right away, which didn't happen right away for me. But I think first aid was a decent, uh, resource all the way through. I know we referenced it quite a bit first year, but sadly, I think that's what kind of what we have to focus on a lot first and second year. It's just one of those things we have to deal with. So I think a lot of my studying actually ended up being step one studying majority of first and second year. Okay. So did you end up like, would you reference first aid, like with every, every lecture that you had in, in during the coursework? 
Yeah, or I think so. How would you integrate your step one prep? Like, how'd you handle that? Yeah, so um, first of all, the first like three months of med school, I just let it all go and didn't like want to worry about too much. And, you know, there's a lot of that gunner mentality that that goes on, and I just I realized that wasn't going to be me because I never felt like I was quite able to become a gunner. I don't know if you guys felt the same way. So I just let the first like couple months yep. go in med school. And then I think second half med school, that's when I started like, oh, we're getting into information that I'm like recognizing in first aid and and recognizing that maybe on like step one kind of material. And so that's when I started referencing first aid. And if it wasn't first aid and it was in the lecture or was talked about in school, I know the class formats changing a lot where it's all online now and you don't actually have to go to class but if it was in both those that's when i'd really pay attention (laughs) to the information so would you say then that the first like year you were just kind of more focused on classwork and just kind of casually used first aid yeah yeah i would say so okay it wasn't until summer of summer after first year where i was like okay i might as well start cracking down on this i see and okay. getting going. And do, do you feel like the first year went well for you with that philosophy? I mean, I think, I mean, testing wise, it went okay. I think it went well. Uh, it just depends. I know med schools are all different, but we took it. I think we, most of the people in our class took step one in April or May of their second year. I know the med students that are in our residency now, just like they're starting their rotations, which is, you know, beginning of April. So they probably took step one you know, March or even February. So I know it's getting earlier and earlier for what med school there from University of Washington, but it worked well for me first year. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what worked for you specifically? Yeah. What I would do is I would flashcard a lecture basically. Um, So this is purely classwork study. This isn't step one study. And so, so whatever lecture was going on, I would flashcard what I felt was important information, either referencing uh, first aid or topics that I felt could be tested on. I wouldn't read the textbook very much. Um, A lot of people were readers. I wasn't a reader. I felt like it was a waste of my time because I got so distracted after reading, I don't know, the first couple paragraphs of the textbook. And so, (laughs) so I would flashcard using Anki, the free one. And that way my, that whole lecture was in a, was in a flashcard deck. And I think a, I think a fair amount of people did that. But um, I think it was really easy for us to make the flashcards really, really big. And I still wasn't learning very well that way. So my flashcards were like one sentence on one side and like one or two words on the other side. And so, hmm. and then I'd make a lot of flashcards. And so if I, if one flashcard was really big and had a lot of words on it for the question and the answer or vice versa or fill in the blank ones, you know, all the nifty tricks you can do on Anki, I kind of got lost. And um, a lot of my studying came from making the flashcard and not borrowing from other people. Because if I could really tone it down to like super basic and one sentence line and one or two answers, that means I really understood the information enough to be able to make it that simple. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I think that's that's really smart to be able to to distill it. And it, and it probably takes a lot of, of preparation, probably more so, to distill it down to fewer words as opposed to maybe like copying, pasting, you know, and having a lot of words in there, which is what I remember doing when I was making Inky Dicks. <laughs> yeah, um, well, whatever works for people. Oh, it didn't work for me. No, I had to. <laughs> <it more. laughs> <laughs> yeah, those. Yeah, I wish. Uh, I wish I chatted with you more during those years. Like, uh, uh-huh. you're going to be really successful. Let's. Uh, let me do what you're doing. So, so with Inky, you've got this uh, space repetition. Were you able to maintain some of those cards through step one, or I guess at what point did you abandon uh, the cards that you you had made for coursework? I di- I did abandon them when the course was over. <laughs> Um, okay. I, I don't know if I, I mean, I trusted the courses enough for the tests that they would give us. I didn't trust them enough for step one. And, uh, and so I didn't, that's, I didn't use them. Smart. I just didn't do it. 
It's an, it's an interesting balance, you know? <laughs> I yeah. think a lot of medical students face that, where it's like, okay, I got to study for the course, and now I got to study for step one. And that when stinks. should I start doing that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, it, should, should I start doing it at the same time, or should I focus on one and then focus on <clears throat> the other one later, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's hard. And I think moving into my second year, or that summer before, and when courses started, I had to separate it out. And so... Like we would go in blocks where we'd study, I don't know, all sorts of weird things at one time, but like a lot of um, like endocrine and like cards and renal and palm, you know, at like one time, you know, I would study that material for step one, but then, you know, also separate class out. So I would first, so when, when lecture was done or after I was done watching the lectures, we had this weird attendance policy where I actually had to go to lectures, which has now been abandoned after we're done <laughs> yeah so yeah uh, after, conveniently after me pete and michael finish our preclinical years yes very mandatory attendance goes away yeah and so if there's no attendance policy i think what i would have done is my first probably two hours this is probably i would say uh six to nine months before uh taking step one i would take two hours and purely study uh step one topics that either we were currently covering in the lecture material or had previously covered. So I actually knew what kind of was going on. And what that meant for me was doing uh, question banks and choosing the topics or whatever, and then referencing first aid while I did those question banks. And so that would, and so I would probably do about, I wouldn't do a lot of questions probably for two hours at the beginning that would probably take, probably do 20 questions for those two hours. And that is not a lot of time. I'd put it in tutor mode or whatever. And so you could, you're still timed, but then you click the answer and then the time would stop on the clock for the actual question. And, um, and then I'd thoroughly review the information and I'd count that as studying. So yeah, I was saying, so yeah, at this point it was just probably two hours of purely step one studying about six to nine months. I think, yeah, probably in the fall of second year. Yeah, that that, uh, that seems to be kind of what a lot of people did in our class. They started so. studying around, you know, October ish. So, so just to be clear, during the first year, you were using primarily Inky, and you were referencing like the lectures, uh, like the the PowerPoint lectures yeah. from our courses, and mastering that information. And then during kind of like the first part of second year you started spending two hours a day using question banks to study for step one. Is that right? Uh, that is right. And referencing first aid while I did it. Cause again, just reading first aid, like wasn't, wasn't going to do it for me. I needed like a higher level of focus to learn the information, like doing questions. So that was probably two hours. Yeah. I would reference first aid. I think the question bank I had, well, it was you world. And so I did it. I just started early because they said that was the best one. And so I trusted the class ahead of us. Yeah. And so I just did it. And I think that's what everyone realized real quick that you world was the best one. And so I'd use that. And then I'd reference first aid in almost like a confirmation that this is important. <laughs> and then I would make a flashcard based off of that question. And it would be a completely separate deck from my uh, class flashcards. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So, so you have this deck that's more dedicated towards step one prep. And, and as you were making those, were you making those with the intention of keeping them and using them and reviewing them all the way through your yes. the time you actually took the exam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting because a lot of people we talk to, you know, they, they use, uh, basically everyone uses UWorld, right? But right. one of our questions is frequently like, how do you retain the information you learn from UWorld? Yeah, And there are a lot of different answers. So that's really interesting to me because that makes it seem like, you know, you're investing time into something that will quickly allow you to review the information that you've gathered from you world. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, it is. And again, like the flashcards that I made, the more words and stuff that were on them, the less I would remember. <laughs> and so it was going through the questions, going through the explanation of the questions. It's right and wrong answers because I think a lot of, I felt like a lot of the board questions were kind of like some of the questions that I studied, but the answers were, 
I don't know, based off of one of the explanations in there. And so a lot of my learning came from the explanations. And so, I don't know, people would brag about going through your world four times. I only made it through once because it would take me so long to get through each question because I would like dissect the explanation to be able to get it on a flashcard that was one or two lines with an answer that was like one or two words to know like what I really needed, uh, what I really wanted to learn from that question. It took a while and I only got through your you world once. They say to get through it twice or whatever, but I only got through it once, but I felt like I really knew, like I, I could go back and repeat every question and knew the question because I really focused on it. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just a time thing. Sure. It's like just a testament to that method and how well it worked. So can you give us some insight into how long it would take you to write a single flashcard and maybe how many flashcards you would make for every U world question? I try to keep it one flashcard per question, per question, which is pretty, which, and I would, so, I mean, you think, I would say for 20, I think during my, when I started really studying for this in the spring, for I do 22 question blocks for some weird reason. I try to do like 66 questions a day, which is not a lot to a lot of people. But I would, um, you know, so for 22 questions, that would take me roughly an hour and a half to two hours to complete. And so you got to break that down. That's a lot of time on a question. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. And that means so you're like, you're not trying to blitz through it. I, I wasn't. And I figured like, why, like, why like blitz through all these things and not really retain any other information and just feel, feel like, Oh, I'm, I'll remember that. Oh, I'll remember that. Oh, I won't make that mistake again. And then you do that question again. And you're like, I have no idea. I don't remember. And so <laughs> yeah. my thought was just to like, really know this one resource really, really well, instead of breezing through it. Multiple yeah, times. I think that's really valuable. Sure, yeah, and then like get to the point where you know that information really well, and and really commit to that. And, you know, I I think a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking, you know, getting through more questions or or adding volume or having more check boxes to check off on your to do list means that you learned a lot more and you're more pre- more prepared for the test. Yeah, and I certainly remember having some of that mentality back when I was studying for that. And I think it's a lot more important to just like almost take a more uh, like an open-minded approach. I don't know how to like describe, describe that exactly, but just what you're doing and or what you said that you did is it seems a lot more focused on content and less on, you know, check boxes. Yeah. It's kind of like the way that I'm like, I'm seeing it. Yeah. And like investing in your brain, you're like, why why rush through this? Like, who cares about today's to-do list? It's like, I want to know this. <laughs> if I'm not going to like know this well now, then no. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and I think it's just changing the to-do list to realize, oh, well, you know, it goes that back to that comparison thing of like, wow, they're doing like 300 questions a day. That's really cool. Hopefully they're remembering everything. If I did 300 questions a day, I wouldn't have learned anything. And so I would have just <laughs> been really cool by saying, I did three, I did 400, 500 questions today or whatever. And right. I don't know, it just didn't work for me. Some people it probably works, but I stuck to my, you know, 60, 70 questions a day and felt like I really knew them and was still able to get to all of you world. Hmm. That's awesome. Now, th- was this during dedicated? Did you say? I did. I did. Six, I probably, yeah, I did uh, 60 to 70 probably up to 80 questions during dedicated study time in 20, 22. I don't know why that number, but I did 22 questions a day during one during coursework. Gotcha. Like leading up to that, when you started getting more serious about step one. Yeah. Okay. So you started doing 22 question, 22 questions a day. You made one flashcard for every single question and it would take you about two hours to get through. Then when dedicated came, you were doing between 60 and 80. Yeah. That's a really interesting strategy. I'm really curious, you know, on, on just like the details of this, because we haven't heard this one before. And I think it, I think this is probably a really good strategy, probably work for a lot of people. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about how you balance that with your coursework. 
So you were doing two hours a day during coursework, and then was the rest of the time just completely dedicated towards, you know, focusing on the the exam for that week or whatever during the course? Yeah, it was. I mean, that's just, I felt like, I felt like I prioritized step one enough where I would start the day off by studying for step one for those two hours. And then felt like, okay, I prioritized. Now I got to like, make sure that I can get to step one and actually take it (laughs) and pass my work. And so, and that would, I would kind of do the same similar approach by using flashcards, you know, for the lectures, like I said earlier, and that would take, I don't know. Interesting. Okay. So you, you kind of were just using your, your strategy that you had started with making flashcards based off of the PowerPoints from the lectures and balancing that while simultaneously doing year old questions and balancing the inky deck from the year old questions. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, totally separate decks, but I would start the day off by studying step one. Like if I started the day off with lecture, I'd be so wiped out by the end of the day, just, or, or whatever to, start studying step one. And that's, I felt like was most important. And I'm mostly focused, uh, during my beginning, a couple hours of studying, um, probably the first 15 minutes of studying, to be honest. And then it's downhill from there. But, uh, I felt like if I didn't do it very first, I wouldn't be able to, uh, it just wouldn't become a quality study. Yeah. So were those two hours every day dedicated towards exclusively doing UWorld or would you spend like an hour and a half doing UWorld and then 30 minutes reviewing that Anki deck? Or how would, you, how would you go about reviewing the Anki deck? Yeah, I guess it was beginning and end of the day, uh, step one. And so I would do the two hours of making the, making the flashcards using UWorld and then at the end of the day, reviewing those flashcards. So like... I guess it would be 30 minutes before I went to bed that night, reviewing through those ones. Okay. But I, I, again, I was a big quality over quantity. And so if it got over, you know, if it got over 100 to 150, I think probably the max I would do flashcards was 100 a day. And again, these aren't long sentences and aren't really detailed or anything. They're very simple. If it got over, a, you know, if I, if I was studying flashcards more than an hour and a half, and I, I would have to limit it to whatever it was. And usually it was around 100. And if I didn't get to them, I didn't get to them. And I just kind of figured like, well, I really know these ones. And so I trusted Anki that eventually the cards that I didn't study would come around. <laughs> so when it came time for dedicated prep time, what were the resources that you ended up using U-World. in addition to the that? Okay. Yeah, you World so first aid. So you World, you just, just those two? And my flashcards. Yep. Okay, sweet. So it was just basically the exact same routine that you had before during during your coursework, except now you had all day to focus. Yeah, it was wonderful and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember you attended a lunch where DIT came and did a presentation and they were going to give one free account. Oh, to- yeah one of the people there and I won and I seem to recall you. Yeah, you won. Yeah, that. I won it. Um, and here you are not having said anything about DIT regarding your, uh, your step one. Did you like give that away or? Nope. Uh, so I used, I kept it selfishly. I wanted to see what it was like. And so I did use it almost like passive. That was, that was like my break time <laughs> kind of passive, passive just information rest your brain rest my brain by watching videos yeah but (laughs) i know a lot of people that really liked dit and if you like um you know short lectures and you know people dedicated to um certain topics i i think it's uh, from what i saw of it and what i watched i thought it was fantastic but i just didn't focus on it because i felt like i was already into my routine yeah no that makes a lot of sense it seems like your routine was working well for you yeah, it it was and I was just going to say by by the time you got to dedicated, you know, you had already been doing U World for a little while. So, like how many questions or what percentage of the test did you completed by the time you reached dedicated? Of U World, probably just um probably just half or under half. Okay. That's a hard question that, prob- that I don't remember, but I imagine <laughs> it's probably around there. <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably a good feeling 
it would have been for me. I, I don't recall very clearly what percentage I had done by the time I started dedicated, but I remember feeling a little stressed out about like, holy cow, how am I going to get through this question bank? Because I was focusing a lot on uh, RX and I had done a little bit of Kaplan. I, my mentality at the time was like, oh, I want to save you world for dedicated, you know. Uh, in retrospect, I probably would have focused a little bit more on you world and abandoned some of these other resources like like you did. And I, I wonder, was that like comforting for you to have reached dedicated and already have completed like 50% of you world? Yeah. Well, once again, I, I took it very, very slow. And so I knew that I had to be ahead in order to complete it. And so I guess it is, I guess it is always a comforting feeling to know that you're not in a panic stage. <laughs> Cause I kind of, I had mapped it out where like, okay, if I do this many questions a day by a week before exam time, I will have completed all of your world sufficiently where I feel like I don't have to go through it again. Yeah. I had, I had, I guess I had planned it out with the number of questions I had to do. And I guess by dedicated study time, being around half was where I wanted to be. Hmm, that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> and you, were you able to then stick to that plan and finish it when you thought you were, were you going to finish it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did. Cool. So did you just kind of stick to that, stick to that plan then throughout dedicated? Did you ever deviate and use like, I can't remember if you said this, like a random timed mode in you world and did, did you ever do like blocks where you simulated the actual exam? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I'd actually, <laughs> um, I took all, I took, I think I took all the MBMEs. Uh, so it was like once a week, how many are there? Maybe I didn't do all of them. I know I did at least five practice exams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think there are like six six or seven now. Probably yeah, were about okay. that many when we took it. Yeah, and so I I took one a week. And so Saturday, I, I studied for six days a week. I took one day off, which was really just nice to have something to look forward to, a day off. I felt like that was my, that was just a great day to have off. But, um, so I studied six days and on that sixth day I would do a practice exam and dedicate again, like the day to the practice exam, even though it's really only three or something hours actual test time. Okay. So you never actually used like timed mode on you world per se, you would do the tutor mode. And then when you would take an MBME, you would use that as like your, your simulated exam. Yeah, I did time tutor. So it was like the, you know, you actually have time on the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I may I may have deviated from that. I may have tried like a couple, you know, tried to do a time test. But again, 40 blocks was too long for me for some reason during study time because I knew I had to review all the questions. And so I'd still stick to my 20 questions or 22 questions um, per U World session. And so I may have deviated from it, but most of the time it was like time tutor. All right, interesting. So you used UWorld, you used the MBMEs, you used Anki, you used a little bit of first aid as reference. And then all, all reference. So, I felt like I went through all of it because of through okay. UWorld. So, so you use Yeah. <laughs> you used first aid heavily as a reference then, right? Yeah. I mean it was always there with me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then you said you also used DIT a little bit. Did you use any other resources like Pathoma or Sketchy or Picmonic or anything like that? Uh, yeah, since you bring up the the visual study things, I'll I'll say a little bit about them and my opinion about them. I think so. I started. I did use Picmonic a little bit, especially for micro and Sketchy for micro during the course studying because it helps. I think it helped a lot. But um, I felt like I was still I was I still couldn't get some of the straight up memorization information that wasn't very intuitive and physiologically based very well. And so I kind of, this may be throwing a wrench into the studying thing, but I kind of made my own picmonics <laughs> and sketches and um, for like straight up memorization stuff. Because I felt like that's why people did the sketches in the micros, right? For that like really intu like non-intuitive genetic diseases or micro and antibiotics, et cetera. Would you guys agree? Oh, yeah. So it's all those items that, like you say, it's not intuitive and yes, rote memorization. It is. And, and you, you totally remember everything during residency. Uh, let me just say that you remember it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you quickly forget it. But I actually, I made my own, I call it like Picmonic houses, I guess, where I would like have a house or an area uh, that 
housed all my gram positive bacteria and then another house would call house all my gram negative bacteria and etc and it would be my own kind of little picmonic and so that really that's the stuff that helped me the most was making that i actually had a baseball field for all my gram positive bacteria and so just really <laughs> weird things that stuck with me it was like down the first baseline was beta hem like beta hemolytic stuff and then like there was a catapult for catalase positive and coag stuff like <laughs> they stuck together when they get shot from the catapult and like i know that was staph aureus and so like all this weird stuff that i kind of made simpler <laughs> because if it was just like picmonic i have to remember all these picmonics but if i put them into like a certain house i'd know like oh it's a gram negative because it's i know it's in there somewhere i have to find it i don't know that was really weird that was one thing that i did really really weird and i thought a lot of people made fun of me for it but it really were it it took again a lot of quality time in order to make them but once i made them like they were there forever and i think i'll, I'll take that back in residency i do know antibiotics really well because of my little picmonic houses or sketchy houses that people still ask me about because pharmacists think we're stupid they're really smart but they think <laughs> we're we're kind of dumb because we don't remember anything which is valid but uh I do know antibiotics <laughs> just because of those little those little houses I built. And so that's awesome. Yeah. That's another random study thing I did. And it made it really super fun for me. I remember one of our classmates that went into ortho, he would make fun of me every day for those things. And so <laughs> You could probably uh, guess who that that's was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably probably could. It's okay. He's an ortho now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah i think so the people like, that really like so i was just say i think people that really like sketchy and um, picmonic worked really well for them and that's awesome you found your own way doing this yourself I did. Yeah, you, I did me and michael would never uh make fun of you for that because we made a our own little image for everything in first aid like we would tag team it like michael oh was going to do That's one right. page and I would do another page and then we'd like draw them all over the whiteboard and leave them there. <laughs> and then groups would come in. They're like seeing this bizarre, huge, intricate, totally, you know, seemingly senseless, you know, <laughs> story. And yeah. I remember hearing a story later of one doctor that walked in and she's like, what is this? <laughs> Thinking like some autistic kid like came and <laughs> just like, or schizophrenic. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. LSD. Yeah. LSD at its best. LSD, or something like, like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I recognize some of the words with the symbols and this is, it's like a beautiful mind. What is, <laughs> yeah. So, right. so me and Michael would never make fun of you. No, that's, we, we totally feel you. The stuff works and it, it has a potential to. So Pete, you did, you did many of the MBMEs. Did you feel like those reflected your step score? Yeah, that's always the question, right? And, um, I never trusted it, but it did. <laughs> it did reflect it pretty well by the end. Awesome. So I, I know that's really hard to take for a lot of people, and I never really took it you know, seriously. I was like, oh, that's giving me insecurity or false hope, and so, but I'm just going to take them, and hopefully it gives me hope. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, but it, it reflected, so it's always nice to get a passing score. And then by the fourth or like my fourth, fifth, and sixth ones were pretty consistent, where I think I plateaued. and. Um, they were within like two points of my actual score. Awesome. So what did you end up getting? So it was a two. If you don't mind us asking. Yeah, it was a 176. No, just joking. Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a, a 252. Awesome. So that's yeah, amazing. A lot so, of people that did, there are a lot of people that did a lot better than me. So take my study habits, <laughs> I will. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very humble, Pete-like response for anyone who has never met Pete before. He's he's like this all the time. Just like really never makes you feel inferior or anything like that. <laughs> he can get something like a 252 and be like, you know, just kind of not pat himself on the back or anything like that, but really try to lift others. So we appreciate that about you, Pete. But seriously, that's an awesome score. And thanks for thanks for sharing that. So you said that your MBMEs uh, reflected that by those last like three tests. Yeah, I think I got like a like a two fifty, two fifty one, two fifty two, maybe one that was a little higher, but it wasn't that much higher. And I figured like, oh well, that's where I'm at. And 
I'm okay with that. I think I, I think it's still like a 250 is like where the people that really want to get into competitive residencies always shoot for. You know, that's always kind of right. a bench, like a high benchmark. You know, like if you get above 250s, you're like good for ortho, optho, derm, etc. And so I always like wanted to shoot for something like that to keep options open because I didn't know. Yeah, just, yeah, just in case your your relatives tried to pull you towards uh, ENT since you had so many ENT relatives, you wanted to be ready to be able to match into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pete's like, no, I'm no, no family medicine all the way, man. <laughs> it was, yeah. And I, uh, there are plenty of people, I think actually majority of the residents that I'm with in this program, like they were, I think they were 250s, 260s. So in our class, we don't go around sharing those, but um, I, I don't know, like happened upon them and they, they all scored really well. And so a lot of people in primary care do really well in step one, all you ortho gunners. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's unfortunate. I think there's this mentality of people who are just like, "Oh, you're in family medicine. You must have not been very bright." And yeah, I can, uh, <laughs> I can say with complete certainty that Pete is one of the brightest individuals I know. So, uh, to all those people who think that, you're definitely wrong. <laughs> there are a lot of very very intelligent people who go into primary care. And we are very lucky to have people like that in primary care. Well, it's nice of you to say. You definitely don't feel smart during intern year. I'll just say that, though. <laughs> yeah, I think that goes for everybody, though. Yeah, I can imagine. I think uh, you tend to feel that way throughout third, fourth year, probably intern year. And then hopefully by the end of your second or third year, you start to feel a little bit more confident in residency, right? Yeah, I hope so. That's what they say. Or rather, it's more of an acceptance. An acceptance. Like you've gone through uh, the stages of grief and now you're just in an acceptance state. <laughs> no, just joking. There are a lot. Yeah, well, people start to feel more comfortable. Well, uh, thanks so much for telling us about your experiences with Step 1 and your first years of medical school. I think you, have, I think you had a lot of uh, really insightful things to say and to share. And, you know, obviously you did really well on Step 1, so... I think this is probably a strategy that would work well for a lot of other people. Before we let you go, Pete, are there any other parting words of advice that you would give to a medical student who just matched or who just got into medical school, maybe like a first a first year medical student who's looking at, you know, what do I do for first and second year? How do I prepare for step one? Any last parting words for them? Mm, you know, I would just try to record all the dumb things you do. Um, because they turn out to be super funny a little bit later. Like I can just, I know that's way off topic, but like, I remember (laughs) it was like during my first year, I was like shadowing like in a, like a neurology clinic and like, it wasn't a clinic. It was actually, yeah, part of the neurology team. And I just wanted to see what it was like. And you know, this guy came in dizziness and like there was high concern that it was actually a stroke. And so they brought him over to the MRI machine and, uh, and he started getting really cold in the MRI. So they're like, somebody go get him blankets. And so I had all my stuff on, like stethoscope or whatever, like my reflux hammer, because I heard that's what you're supposed to bring when you're doing neurology as a first year. And so <laughs> I, I went I ran and got blankets and then went straight into the MRI room, like just disregarding the whole like <laughs> no metal, like nothing. And like it was, I just got, I, I got like, pushed out of the room like no like they just like shoved me out of the room and like i like i fell down and it was more than embarrassing um for me as a first year (laughs) the guy did get his blankets though but uh it was just i don't know just like stuff like that that i look back on like oh that's like why they make movies of all the stupid things that we do (laughs) I don't know. Just like, yeah, getting in with good friends, trying to enjoy it, keeping priorities straight as much as you can. And um, it'll work out. <laughs> I love that. That's... Yeah, those are, uh, those are some good parting words. Some good <laughs> advice. Uh, yeah, definitely a lot, of, a lot of amazing experiences during medical school. Some are very embarrassing. Some are funny. Some are just awful. <laughs> some are but, just awful. Uh, I think that's a... I think that's a good idea to re- to record record those those experiences. All right. Well, I think that's uh, 
that's everything we have for you, Pete. Thanks for coming on the show again. And we really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for doing this course. Pretty awesome. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to go to our website at physio.com to check out our growing library of free step one videos. You can also find our physio group on Facebook to join our growing community of students preparing for step one. If you've been enjoying the episodes and have been getting value from the content, here are three easy ways that you can support us. One, press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Two, leave us a review. To do that, just go to physio.com slash podcast. Three, find your friends who are in medical school or interested in medical school and tell them about the podcast. Thanks for listening and join us next time.